Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us for our call today. Uh, my name is Sarah Durr, and I'm the Medication Management Lead here at the Iowa Healthcare Collaborative. I also have Jennifer Kriegmer, who has been my opioid kind of queen with me here for the HIN over the last seven or eight months now, and she'll be transitioning out as of tomorrow. And we also have Lana Comstock with us as well, who will be transitioning into that role within the HIN. So we're very excited to have you all on today. Um, I have not muted you all because I'm not hearing much background noise, so please mute your own phone. And if we do hear a lot of background noise, I'll go ahead and hit mute all. Today, we just wanted to kind of kick off our community meetings and talk a little bit about what these will look like, how you can get it kind of set up and prepped. And Jennifer will chime in um, throughout this as well, as she's had quite a bit of experience along with me on some of these community meetings. So the first thing I wanted to mention, and I do not have slides for this, so I'm happy to send out an email afterwards or feel free to reach out if you have questions or concerns about how to do this. I just kind of wanted to go through what a community meeting is, what it looks like, and kind of some of the background on how to get it set up, what you might need to include in order to get it all set to go, and then we'll just briefly go through the slides so you can see what these look like and how to follow along with the notes. So first and foremost, our community meetings really stemmed out of our first cohort, where we asked the question on the pre-survey about where our cohort was out and actually talking to their community, what education they had set up, and how they were going to educate not only the community, but other healthcare providers on opioids. Um, and so from that, we saw that not very many of our, of our uh, cohort was actually participating in um, participating in community meetings and pieces like that. I apologize if we're having some technical difficulties here. My computer just said my internet was a little bit low, so I apologize if that happens here. Can somebody put in the chat box right now if you can hear us and if you can see our screen okay? And then looking down the list, um, if anybody starts where you cannot hear us or you cannot see something, just please put it in the chat box. That's a pretty consistent uh, way to communicate with us because we have muted everybody at this point. So wonderful. Perfect, thank you all. So as I was saying in our first cohort, we noticed the majority of our hospitals were not doing community outreach from the get-go and that was something that was really needed and they could use some help with. So Jennifer and I worked with IHC here and our staff to set up what we termed community meetings. And Jennifer and I, with our first cohort, actually went out and uh, did some of these community meetings. Well, given that our cohort is over 40 now, we knew that it would be a little difficult for us as IHC staff to get out and hit all of your hospitals to do this training. So in order to allow for your hospitals to help your community and help your healthcare professionals learn about the project, we created uh, Train the Trainer. And that's what we're gonna talk a little bit about today. So we do have slides ready. I'll show you the notes section on all the scripting for you all in place, and we will get these up on Innovation in the next couple of days here. The first thing I wanted to start out is we had a couple of sites that were extremely successful in getting people out to their community meetings. And what we found is that it, did take, it does take some setup and some prep and kind of some background work for you to be able to be super successful at these. First, you need to make sure that you're finding the right time for your community and your healthcare providers that works best for them. What I noticed, at least with the sites I went to, and Jennifer can chime in here, uh, it typically was best to either have it around the noon hour or in the early afternoon. When you start getting into the evening hours, we saw less and less numbers, at least with the sites I went to. Jennifer, was that similar for you? Yes, I agree with that. And I think what it did is it gave people the opportunity during the day to become prep. We saw a lot of people from long-term care and different areas that are also working during the day. So it was nice to have a lunch and learn. I know that um, one hospital did a lunch and learn. That was probably our largest one-time meeting. So I think when we look forward to doing these meetings, to start with a during the day meeting would be the best, but as you go to replicate these meetings into your community, you can work with that organization to see what is their norm and where do they get the best attendance. That's where some of your meetings may go into the evening. I think that's great advice. And then some things that we learned was really to market this appropriately. So not only getting it to your healthcare professionals, at your particular facility, but reaching out to local clinics, reaching out to long-term care, even reaching out to some of your smaller community groups, 
Um, for example, one of our hospitals had this little old ladies coffee group that came and they had heard about it and wanted to bring this back to their coffee group. So reaching out to groups like that that would be interested in some of this work and want to know more about what they can do in the community is going to be key in targeting them for marketing. And here they, yep, and also the radio stations and the newspaper. Um, we do have a press release that's available if you're interested in that. And we could probably, what we'll do is we'll put that out on Innovation as well here in the next couple of days. We'll update that. Um, but it comes with a statement from our president, Dr. Evans. And it also um, will give you some verbiage that you can go ahead and give the radio station and the TV um, to, you know, kind of put this out to your community. And we did find with these meetings that oftentimes the newspaper would show up or the, the radio would actually come and record something that we said. Um, so that's kind of a unique way to get this information into your community beyond just those meetings is reaching out to some of those as well to share what you're doing. The other thing that we did is at some of our sites, we had some tools that we would bring with. So things like our Choosing Wisely, which we can add that information onto Innovation as well. And so we do have that available as well as a couple other opioid documents on innovation that you can pull from and utilize those if you want to print anything out or share it with your community at these meetings. And sir, I just really think before you, um, prior to scheduling and, and um, starting your community meeting, have some time to meet with Lana and she can walk you through some suggestions and you know, really this is your meeting, but she can make some recommendations for what resources you'd like to show and um, kind of keep you um, on track maybe with the timeline of who you should be contacting prior to your meeting to make sure it's successful because really to take a lot of time to plan this and then only have a few people show up, that's kind of disheartening. So it's worth the time. Usually what we say is to plan this for six weeks or more out. Perfect. Any other thoughts on setup or marketing that either of you have? Nope. I think that uh, before you do that, I would ask out on Innovation. I know that we're not utilizing Innovation that well, but this is a great place if you have questions. And just a reminder, I did send an email out asking for where your facility is right now with some key points. If you guys could all answer those questions and give them back, we're, we're doing that not only so we have a good handoff as I um, depart here, but also to see how can we assist you? These Tuesday Zooms are optional, but we want to make sure that we're giving you information that you are needing to move forward with the project. So please uh, make sure to answer that, um, those six or seven questions. Any other housekeeping or transition things we need to inform them of? Nope, and this is being recorded right now. So um, usually I will say that the Tuesday Zooms will not be recorded. Um, this is not a formal webinar. So we are recording this one only for the community meeting. But if you have questions that you'd like us to go through at the end of this meeting, if you came with questions today about the project, if you could type those into the chat while we're working here and we'll answer those quickly at the end. Okay, I think that's, yeah. Yeah, perfect. Thank you so much, Jennifer, for your thoughts and input. I am actually going to switch out of my slides so you all can see what this looks like. Um, so what we have done is we actually took the time to go into our notes section here, and not only will you have the slides, but you will have all of these notes on scripting, on instructions, just some information to help you through. And if you do want to print these slide by slide, you can go up to file print, and if my computer will cooperate here. So if you go up to file print, maybe, we'll try again after and see if it wants to cooperate. Um, but all of this information is here and you can literally print off the slide with the note section under it so you have it all right there in front of you. If you're not sure how to do that and I can't show you later, we can make sure that I teach you how to do that. So some of the instructions we put in here, and you can change the names on here if it's you presenting rather than the two of us, um, but have, make sure that you have some time to present at the community meeting. Thanks everybody for coming, all of those pieces. Make sure you share who you are, why you're here. Um, we ask that you not modify the slides beyond maybe adding your own logo down here, but keeping our logo on here as well. And then if there are some slides where you want to add something or change something and you're not sure about it, you can always reach out. And we will try our best to keep these updated on Innovation. As you will see if any of you were at our community meetings last year, we have had quite a bit of change in a lot of our statistics and things like that. 
And then we also have a request that you please send date, location, and total number of attendees to either Lana or myself when you complete a community meeting. This is more so for our own internal tracking, just to capture how far our reach is with these meetings. If you do have information on number of providers versus EMS versus nursing on who exactly was there, we appreciate that as well, but not a requirement with this. So with that, this is the only slide that I have instructions on. Then we have our scripting. So you'll go through and do your welcome, who you are, anything in bold is up to you to change to your own fit and what is with you. So name your local hospital or group and then enter your presenter's names. And then I'm not gonna go through all the scripting since we do have it all here for you, but telling the upstream story is really important to say why we're doing what we're doing and the importance of the upstream piece to prevent opioid use disorder. And so again, the upstream story is all written out for you here. You can always Google it if you want a little bit different version. I know that I've, I've told it a little bit different just depending on what my audience is and the day. So it's okay if it changes up just a little bit here. I did add that at IHC, we are looking at the opioid crisis from three pillars. And I have the scripting here for you as well. But looking at the upstream prevention and appropriate prescribing, addiction, treatment, and relapse prevention, and then diversion prevention and medication disposal. So we're really focusing in on that prevention piece with these slides so that our community understands the importance of that prevention piece. Then we go into a little bit about our opioid guardianship project. I do have a slide about who the Compass HIN is. And hopefully you all have a good handle on this, but the scripting should help you out in knowing exactly what to say and who we are, and that's the fact that we're mostly rural or critical access hospitals. And then there's a slide around the purpose of our project, so talking about reframing pain, creating a culture of judici judicious prescribing, utilizing treatment plans for any patient discharged on an opioid, and then who all can be involved. And this really goes into anybody that's interested in being a part of the project and helping combat this crisis is welcome to be involved through this. Typically, it's been hospital-based community leaders, but we have seen some sites that have uh, law enforcement or others that are active and want a voice at the table. We then have our current Take Two cohort here. So you can see that we're spread all across Iowa into South Dakota and Illinois. Um, and the big thing here, I think, is to just show how far spread we are in Iowa, and we really are more of a rural group here. We have the benefits for participating that you all have seen several times from um, both Jennifer and I, myself in getting involved in this project. So we watch, walk through what those benefits are and why it's a great job or great reason to get involved in this project. The next one, we go into a little bit more of this opioid medication information. And this is where I will say, that any healthcare provider can truly do this presentation. This is very low level opioid information for you all to, to take a look at. If you're unsure about anything or have questions about anything, your pharmacist can help you or I am more than happy to walk you through some of this information to make you feel more comfortable with it. But again, we've got all of our scripting. So walking through non-medication options such as PT, acupuncture, and counseling to even some of our non-opioid medications such as Tylenol or NSAIDs anticonvulsants and antidepressants. We talk very high level about what an opioid is. And so we just talk about how it's a synthetic chemical that actually reduces the feeling of pain. And then name some commonly uh, prescribed opioids so that people are looking at those names and get a better feel of what that might be called. A lot of people don't realize that Vicodin and Percocet are both opioids, or they might not realize that fentanyl is an opioid. So having those names on there can help them better understand what an opioid is. We then talk very high level about the possible use of opioids, and this is where we talk about severe short-term pain or severe long-term pain due to surgery or severe injury, and then definitely opioids have their place in cancer pain and end-of-life comfort. So that, that's a big reason that we have that. We also have some information in there that prescribers should weigh the risk versus benefit on opioid treatment and non-opioid treatment. And then our last bullet is one that we want you to emphasize, and that's why I have that bolded piece in the note, is to emphasize this. When starting an opioid medication, the dose should always be started low, and if needed, increase very slowly. At each visit, a decrease in the dose should be considered, and alternative therapies should be explored. So that's a key piece on that slide. 
we start talking about goals. And this is where we start getting into comfort versus functionality. Again, the scripting is all there for you, um, but just sharing that we are really looking at, are you comfortable rather than talking about pain and looking at functionality. So are you able to do the things that you need to do, such as getting dressed or getting the mail? And are you able to do the things that you wish to do, such as going to your child's soccer game, maybe doing some gardening, those pieces. So it's all filled out in that scripting for you. And again, if you need to change up that scripting a little bit, we understand to fit your own style. This is much more Jennifer and my style that we've kind of created in the number of these that we have done. There's some information about opioid side effects and the red ones are the more common ones that we see. I do have a little piece around another side effect to keep in mind is the increased sensitivity to pain. So the longer a patient takes an opioid, the more pain receptors come up and therefore more of the opioid is needed to decrease the pain. I think that's always surprising to, especially if you have a patient or a lay person in the audience, they don't know that that side effect is something that they can have. And that's why we are so concerned about continuing to up the dose of your opioid because you can have that increased sensitivity to pain. We do talk a little bit about opioid overdose signs, and this is simply to make sure that patients know when they should call 911, and one information we as healthcare providers need to be offering them if they are started on an opioid. And then this one's a little bit longer of a slide. Um, I kind of added to this one some information around questions to ask about opioids. Patients don't really know what to ask, and even if we say, do you have any additional questions? Or what additional questions do you have? Or how can I answer any questions for you? They still oftentimes will leave with questions and not even realize that they have them and then not know how they can reach out and what they should ask. So this is just a list to give them, um, kind of walks through what the question is and why it's important for them to ask that question. So it's a little bit longer, uh, but gives you a good information there. And then our last question is really that prescription for naloxone as a reversal agent, talking about how I think of naloxone as the EpiPen for allergies. So naloxone should be, for opioid users, what the EpiPen is for allergies or what glucagon is for diabetes. So we have that listed as well. This goes into more of the statistics and some of the timeline of opioids in the background. Again, this is pretty high level, but if you have questions about it, please just reach out and let us know. I always start with our opioid timeline, and I think both Jennifer and I get excited about this timeline. And the reason that I start with this is that it really highlights how we got to where we are today, why this epidemic came up. And so talk through the 1950s and 70s where oxycodone became available. However, we had the World Health Organization saying this is not addictive. Then we get into the 80s where we're seeing, I don't know about this opioid. I don't know if I want to prescribe these things. But we have this huge push for prescribers to start using it for other things other than non-terminal illness. Into the 1990s, we see successful lobbying for an increased use of opioids, as well as physicians expanding treatment of pain. And furthermore, there was a lot of marketing efforts that were targeted towards pharma from pharmaceutical companies to healthcare providers directly. And then in the early 2000s, we saw pain as a fifth vital sign, saw some of this quality being linked to pain, and research on uh, abuse deterrent formulations came out because we saw an increase in misuse and abuse. And then I always say at the end, and this is up to you if you're comfortable saying this or not, I am because I truly believe that this is where we as healthcare providers need to take on a uh, leadership role. And so I always say, now I start with this timeline when discussing this crisis because it truly shows that healthcare providers as a whole have contributed to the crisis. It's not just physicians, not just pharmacists, not just organizations or the pharmaceutical companies. It's really all of us as healthcare that contributed to this epidemic and we need to take the time to fix it. And Sarah, if I can jump mm -hmm. in on the screen real quick. <clears throat> I think it's really important when you're talking about this screen, this is a good place for engagement. Mm -hmm. How did you, who, who, was, who remembers this time? How did that make you feel? I think and also to also say that our patients remember these things happening. And what, you know, what is their attitude? Every patient is gonna have a different attitude depending on which area in this timeline that they, you know, basically um, feel that that's where, you know, they were brought up or that's where their mind goes. So basically what they relate to is how they're gonna act. So throughout these, all of these things, make sure to ask for engagement, whether it's just healthcare providers or patients being there, because really that's what's important. How do they feel, you know, and, and what are they gonna do with this information? And you'll see at the end, we're gonna ask that, but kind of to tee up those questions. 
Thank you, Jennifer. I'll make sure I get that added to the scripting as well so we don't miss that piece. Mm -hmm. Just a few statistics now. One in four people are receiving an opioid long term in a primary care setting struggles with addiction. So we kind of have that as more of a, a something that they need to realize how epic or how high and bad this epidemic truly is. More statistics. Um, again, go over what you feel comfortable with. I have put a lot of the scripting in here and updated actually all of these statistics since we did these in the fall. And so I still have some information around in 2012, over 259 million prescriptions were written for opioids. And that's enough for every adult over the age of 18 in the US to receive a 30 day supply of opioids. I think that's really staggering for people to, to realize how much has been prescribed and out there, as well as our last statistics around four and five new heroin users started out misusing prescription painkillers. So 80% of our new heroin users started out with prescription painkillers. Then we go a little bit into the opioid crisis in Iowa. On this slide, I know both Jennifer and I have liked to say, we were surprised by the statistic that most common characteristic for patient hospitalization for opioid related reasons, so hospitalization, is a female over 65 in the metropolitan area and low income. And so we were surprised by that because I think a lot of the news coverage highlights younger males and they're highlighting the deaths rather than the hospitalizations. And so we have a little information on there around, well, it does make sense. They could have been started on this 10, 20 plus years ago. And then other factors might be playing into it, such as the loss of their spouse, loss of their friends, lack of nearby family, et cetera. So really kind of discussing that piece. And I know this is where we often would engage the audience and say, um, is this something that you guys would expect? Is this what you're seeing in your hospital? So I think that's a really interesting way to get them talking about no, I didn't expect this, or oh yeah, this is what we're seeing. I did keep this slide in. Um, it is a little outdated, but I think it really shows, yes, Iowa is sitting more in that lowest to average number of prescriptions per, one, per 100 people. However, I always say I would rather have us on the far left end, on that low, low end, rather than have us continue to move to the right to a more higher level of prescribing. And again, that's all in the scripting for you in there. This is a slide that we actually took from the CDC and kind of altered um, to have it be more up to date with the current cost of these medications. And so the way I kind of talk through this is think about one of your friends, maybe goes in for a sports injury, and then they're started on an immediate release medication such as hydrocodone. Um, they are taking this as directed, but it seems like it's just not enough for their pain. So they go back in and get a little bit stronger medication with the oxycodone, Still doesn't seem to be doing the trick, and so they go back in, get a long-term uh, or long-term oxycotton, which is taken twice a day, um, and still taking that as-needed medication. Still isn't enough, so they go back into the doctor, and the physician says, "You know what? I, I can't give you any more. This is the max that I can prescribe for you." And due to the pain, they might actually be approaching friends or trying to take medication out of um, somebody's home in order to make sure that they're getting the pain level that they feel they need addressed. And that can even make them turn to the street to actually start buying Oxycontin or the Oxycodone out on the street. And you can see the pricing on those is quite high with Oxycontin above $80 per tablet and Oxycodone immediate release above $50 per tablet. And so what I always say here is that person then starts to realize that this is a three or $400 per day cost to them. And then they discover that a bag of heroin is only $15 and that can last them a couple of days. So why would they continue to spend three or $400 a day when they may only need to spend five or 10 in order to get the high that they need? And that's where that really spiral happens and how easy it is to fall into the use of heroin. And Sarah here, I think this is another good place to engage people to say, who do you know that's currently in this cycle? And are you in this cycle? You know, how can you not move to that next level or how can you help someone else not move to the next level. Yeah, that's a great point. And then our next slide really just shows that opioid illegal deaths have increased since 1999. And so the use of natural opioids or semi-synthetic opioids in that purple line has been increasing since 1999. And then our heroin in that blue line really spiked up right around 2010 and is now surpassing the use of the natural or semi-synthetic opioids. So I think that just reiterates what the last slide really shared. We do have some data in here for our first cohort participants. This is more so because it's kind of eye-opening that this project does work, and the last time we did it, it was a much shorter time period. 
So we have our pre and post survey results. This is showing the percentage of providers and hospital staff access into PMP prior to prescribing an opioid. And so we just show with the white that it was very low or I'm not sure. And then the black bars show that it went up into that 26 to 75 percent range. And that was a huge win for us to see that the PMP is being accessed more due to this project. We also have a slide on percentage of institutions providing opioid awareness and education for their community. This again is the reason that we started doing these community me meetings and are here doing the train the trainer today. And so you can see prior to the project, it was maybe about 18% actually doing this. Post project, we have almost 85% of our institutions doing this. So again, another big win for this project and being able to get out in our communities and teach those around us about this epidemic. And then our last survey slide is just around the percent of institutions knowledgeable of local medication disposal sites for controlled substances. It went from about 60% not knowing or knowing where their disposal site was all the way up to 100%. So we called that a very big win and that everybody knew where their local disposal site was so we can hopefully get some of these out of our homes and properly disposed of so we do not have children or others coming in and taking them. We then kind of talk about tools to gauge comfort. This is our most up-to-date scale, so it is the finalized version. However, we are in the process of copywriting it, so please keep all logos on it as is and do not change anything other than your facility's logo at the top. These are available on Innovation for you with a fillable um, version, so you are able to add in your facility's logo. And this we just talk a lot about Think about if somebody asks you how much pain you're in. A lot of patients will say, well, I'm about a four today. My back hurts, my head hurts. Yeah, I'm probably around a three or a four. But if I reframe that to say, how comfortable are you? And that's a more positive statement. A lot of patients will say, yeah, I'm actually pretty comfortable. And just by making that change to a more positive thought in the brain, that could, could potentially reduce the amount of opioids prescribed and it could cause the patient to feel more comfortable. And that's what our comfort scale study is all about, is the impact that this actually has on our patients and in healthcare. So that's an important thing to mention. You don't need to talk about the study, but you can mention that that is what we believe is going to come out of this study. We do have our comfort menu templates, which I'm sure you all have seen at some point or another. We talk through some of the different resources and then really focus in on this medication section over here as we were very intentional on how we wrote that um, and suggest that if they can not change that, we, we would appreciate that since it was very intentional how we did it. Everything else there is fillable so that it fits with your organization and what you actually offer. And again, your hospital logo can be added to this document. And then we have our post-operational comfort plan. Again, walk through kind of what this is, how it can be used, why it should be used, and how a patient can understand how to use it. Scripting is all there once again, and your hospital logo can be added. And Sarah, when you're looking at these forms, if your tool looks different than our tools, this is somewhere you want to replace our mm -hmm. tools and put in the tools that you're utilizing. And we also had a question that I wanted to cover real quick. For the community meetings, do you want us to use the entire PowerPoint presentation or we can remove slides as appropriate? We're providing you these slides just like all the other slides from our webinars. Please free, feel free to utilize any of these slides. If you choose to put them outside of our slide deck, please just make sure to give credit and note where you got the information from. So yes, um, you may have 10 minutes to pre present to someone and you want to just pull up a few of these. This is really um, um, some slides that you can just utilize and pull where, whatever works for what the presentation that you're going to be doing. Is. And I think that's a good point. Some of our yeah. community meetings were 30 minutes. Some of them could have been an hour and a half, just depending on who was there and what the facility mm -hmm. wanted. So definitely feel free to edit if you need to. And then talking about resources in your communities, this is our medication disposal sites. And so this link at the bottom, they can actually go to and type in their zip code and find where the closest one is to that location. And we do have a medication disposal sites in all 99 counties in Iowa now. Um, and that could be their local pharmacy with a little pill bottle, or it could be their local law enforcement site with the badges. So making sure they know that they can use that link to find their local disposal site. This is our addiction specialists and treatment facilities. And we do believe this includes all of our buprenorphine medication assisted treatment providers as well on here. 
Not all providers are listed because they are not required to be listed if they're part of that suboxone or buprenorphine um, waiver. However, if they wish to go to the website and search, I know that I've seen a change in the number of providers just in the last couple of weeks even. So there's definitely some chances that they've had additional providers added recently. We do have some information about the naloxone standing order here, and this is for any pharmacy that's interested in participating. They are not required to report if they are a part of this until they actually dispense a, a dose of naloxone. So your pharmacy could potentially be participating in the standing order, have it signed and able to dispense naloxone, have it on their shelves, but not be at this actual link yet until they dispense an actual dose of naloxone. And so that's the nice thing is that your patients could talk to their local pharmacy, check out that website and see if they're listed, if they did want to get naloxone without a prescription. And if you need more information on that program, I'm happy to share that with you. That passed in 2016. And then we did put some discussion questions here at the bottom, um, just for, for your reference, if you want to have that discussion with them. If you're interested in more so just keeping it open, let them ask questions. If you don't know the answer to a question, please feel free to reach out to Lana or I, and we will get that information for you to share back with the person that asked that question. And you can always ask the group what they would prefer to do. The, do they want to do discussion questions? Do they not? Um, we've had some groups that love doing discussion questions and some that just wanted to leave afterwards. So totally depends on your group and kind of get a feel and a read for your group of what they would like to do. And then we do have a slide with our contact information um, for Lana and I, but again, you can change that to be your contact information at the end if you would like. Jennifer, any thoughts on those slides? Um, I just wanted to say that Heather um, is on the phone from Horn and they had an amazing community meeting. So Heather, I know um, I'm not seeing your phone number. I'm gonna try to unmute everybody. Okay, um, Heather, can you, can you speak up so I can see if I can hear you? I'll unmute can you my... hear me? Is that up first? Yes. Okay. Heather, what phone number are you calling from? Because I'm going to just unmute you. Are you 712? Yeah. Yep. Okay. I'm going to mute everybody again, and I'm only going to unmute you because we're having some background noise. Heather? Yes. Okay, um, Heather, and I know I'm putting you on the spot, but you really did um, um, execute such a nice community meeting. Could you just give two or three bullet points of why you felt that your community meeting was successful, but then also add in what this um, did for your community and for your hospital by actually having a community meeting? Um, I think it was really successful because we did a really good job of getting it out into the community. We did use your guys' flyers um, to put it in the paper, but then also to post it in all of our um, facilities and waiting areas. Um, and then we also did a um, radio clip on it as well. Um, so just really trying to draw our community's attention to it. Um, we also invited all of our clinic staff um, from both physicians clinics um, in town and wanted them to be really involved since they are kind of the primary site where a lot of times that prescribing happens. Um, so that was really good to get their staff involved and engaged um, and I felt like they they really did take it seriously. We also had um, local pharmacies that we reached out to and they were really gung-ho um, and glad to come and glad for the interaction. Um, so I think a lot of it came down to just getting the word out there um, and doing some education on the fact that this is kind of a national crisis and that we are personally trying to improve it here in our community as well. Wonderful. And, it, and Heather, can you just let everybody know what this what happened after your community meeting with engagement not only from maybe frontline staff and healthcare providers, but from your community? Yeah, um, we actually had one of our pharmacies become a drop site because they were really interested in this whole project moving forward. And then we also had um, our physician's clinics um, really take a leap forward as far as um, making sure that all of our providers were registered to check the PMP sites, that they knew how to do it. Um, we started doing the care plans with our patients 
um, both in the hospital side and the clinic side. Um, so that was very beneficial as well. Um, and then we also did um, pain contracts as well. Um, so I think, you know, starting with the education for our clinics was great and then getting them the resources they needed to actually carry it out and implement it was, was very good for us. Thank you so much, Heather, for sharing. And before I ask uh, for questions, you can ask any of us. I'm gonna um, have anybody who has questions, go ahead, type your questions in. Heather, I'm gonna keep you live in case I'm gonna have you answer anything. But Heather, are you on Innovation? Yes. So if anybody has questions for Heather to answer, um, can you please put your questions on Innovation? And Heather, can you kind of watch the conversation that happens in the medication safety? Um, and I'll, I'll help remind you, Arlana or Sarah will, but I think this is a really nice platform just to say, you know, and we don't have to go over this right now, but how soon before your meeting did you do this? But I think as those questions get answered, it'll be nice for everybody to see those. Okay. I fully agree. And Heather, that's impressive that you're able to get so much of the community actually um, involved in this. And it was simple enough of just reaching out and making sure they were aware. Right. Okay, so if you have any questions um, about the project or about what we just went over, you can go ahead and put them into the chat section. And um, I know we're going a little bit over. We like to honor your time, but I think this is really important. And I will just add as we're waiting for people to add any questions, I just want to thank Jennifer for the time she spent on this project. I know I'm going to miss her greatly and excited to work with Lana, but sad to have her leaving us, but excited for her next opportunity. So thank you so much, Jennifer. Thanks, Sarah. Jennifer, um, that's the same from me. Um, I appreciate everything that you're doing to help me with my learning so I can take over and work with Sarah and still be um, available to all the hospitals. And I know that you're just a shout out should we have any questions. Absolutely. Um, so really appreciate everything you've done and especially with your role in aiding that development of that comfort scale. And, Want to make sure we get your name attached to that. Mm -hmm. So, thank totally you. Agree. Thank you. Okay. Well, we're not seeing any questions. Don't hesitate to reach out to one of us or anybody on Innovation. You do have questions or thoughts on this community meeting. Heather, thank you for your time and for being put on the spot so that we could get some great information on that. And we will talk to you all again very soon. Have a great rest of your day.